May 2nd, 2017. In the Resistance Report, we attempt to link together various stories, give you context, enable you to understand the larger picture of what's actually going on. The theme tonight is chaos and stupidity. Now, that could be the theme of any night of the Trump administration, any day in Trump world, but it has particular relevance today because it includes not only the White House, but also what's happening in Congress. In the House of Representatives, almost all day now, Paul Ryan and House leadership have been trying to craft a compromise that will get 100, actually 216 votes, that's what they need, in order to replace Obamacare. I know, I know, you may say to yourself, they're still at it? Yes, they are still at it. Trump wants a replacement. Actually, Trump wants a repeal, and some Republicans want something that might replace it. The House Freedom Caucus doesn't want much of anything, and the problem for Paul Ryan and the Republicans is very simple, and it's, had, it's, it's really came up today once again. In order to keep the Freedom Caucus, that is conservative Republicans, in the fold, they have had to come up with some sort of a plan that is basically a repeal. Not a replacement, but basically a repeal. But at the same time, you've got these moderate, so-called, I love this term, moderate Republican. There are really no moderate Republicans, but at least relative to the House Freedom Caucus, they are moderate. And they don't want to lose the provision that provides coverage for people with pre-existing health conditions. That's really the stickler. And so what Paul Ryan and the leadership have been trying to do, and Donald Trump continues to say you've got to come up with something, is to bring the moderate Republicans on board. And what they're saying is that, well, any state that opts out of the Affordable Care Act, and that's the key to the compromise, any state can opt out, they have to provide some coverage and guarantee that insurance companies will provide some coverage for people with pre-existing health problems. Here's the problem with that idea, because there is nothing in the House bill that guarantees that this high-risk insurance pool comprised of people who have pre-existing conditions will be affordable to anybody. In other words, insurance companies can charge whatever they want. And so the Republicans have been all day today trying to come up, come up with money that would enable that high-risk pool of people with pre-existing conditions to have some subsidies so that some of them could afford to have health insurance. But it's not working. In fact, today the Center for American Progress came up with a study which showed that the latest Republican health care plan falls $200 billion short of sufficiently funding one of those high-risk pools. What this all means is that people with pre-existing health problems will not be able to afford coverage under the Republican plan. That's all you need to know, and that really is all the Republican, the wavering Republicans, the Republicans, most of them in states that Hillary Clinton actually won. These are Republicans who are very, very vulnerable in the midterm elections. They know they're vulnerable, and you have been doing a fabulous job letting them know how vulnerable they actually are. And they keep saying to the leadership, we have got to have something that gives us cover with regard to the people who are going to lose coverage. And what you've been doing is letting those wavering House Republicans know that nothing, nothing is going to be good enough. And you're right. Nothing is good enough except the Affordable Care Act. Chaos and stupidity. The Republicans cannot repeal the Affordable Care Act because they can't come up with a replacement. They've been trying for seven years to come up with a replacement, and Donald Trump trying to tell them to do it is not changing the dynamic. Now, warning. Here's the warning. It could happen any time. The minute Paul Ryan gets those 216 votes, now he can't afford to lose more than 22 Republicans, but if he gets 216 votes, if he, if he pulls in enough Republicans, he's going to schedule a vote right away. So your being activist, being on the phones, making sure, reminding your member of Congress that you don't want this, keeping the Democrats in line,
keeping the Democrats with backbone because they have not wavered in the House. That's critically important. Keep doing what you are doing. Meanwhile, chaos and stupidity, Trump called this morning for a government shutdown in September after the funding measure that funds government until September runs out because he's so angry that none of his priorities got into that funding bill that runs out in September. So he's saying, well, we ought to, we ought to really think seriously about a shutdown in September if, if I don't get my way. If my priorities are not in that bill, I think that Republicans ought to shut down government. That's what he said. I'm not making this up. Now, you remember, of course, you know, Donald Trump and Republicans run the government. Donald Trump is in charge of the executive branch of government. Shutting down the government means shutting Donald Trump down. Do you get it? Donald Trump is calling and threatening a shutdown of himself and his executive branch in September if he doesn't get what he wants. Chaos and stupidity. Now, I was there uh, when Newt Gingrich tried to shut down the federal government and did shoot down, shut down the, the federal government in 1996. There were two shutdowns. Do you know what that did? It basically cost Newt Gingrich his speakership. It helped re-elect Bill Clinton. It basically cost a lot of Republican House seats. The public doesn't like government shutdowns. It doesn't like it when a party uses the threat of a shutdown to try to get its way. You remember Ted Cruz in 2013 tried the same thing? He tried with Republican House members, and there was a shutdown in October of 2013. It did them no good. Ted Cruz became so unpopular that he didn't even bring that effort on his part up when he was running for president in 2016. Why doesn't Donald Trump remember these things? When he is calling for a government shutdown of his own government, why doesn't he remember? Maybe he has got a problem with history. Maybe Donald Trump doesn't really know American history at all, even history that he lived through. I mean, he has a maybe, and I don't want to insult first graders, but he's got a first grade appreciation of American history. This is what he said recently on Sirius XM Radio. He said, had Andrew Jackson been a little later, you wouldn't have had the Civil War. Again, I'm not making this up. I'm going to go on with that quote. This is Donald Trump talking. Jackson was a very tough person, but he had a big heart. He was really angry that he saw what was happening with regard to the Civil War. He said, there's no reason for this. People don't realize, you know, the Civil War, if you think about it, why? People don't ask that question. But why was there a Civil War? Why could that one not have work, been worked out? This is Donald Trump saying. Now, here's the problem. Uh, Andrew Jackson, President Andrew Jackson, died 16 years before the start of the Civil War. He owned slaves. He had absolutely nothing to do with the political tensions leading up to the Civil War. He never talked about or had anything to do with secession. As one of you put it, General Custer would have prevented World War II if he had taken control of the 7th Cavalry a little sooner. He was a great guy with a big heart and blonde hair. Most people don't know Custer had blonde hair. Donald Trump's appreciation of history is no appreciation at all. Uh, here's another thing he said just a couple of days ago. Frederick Douglass is an example of somebody who's done an amazing job and is getting recognized more and more, I notice. Unquote. Uh, this was a part of a talk that Trump gave on Black History Month. Now, Douglass, Frederick Douglass, uh, you may know, died in 1895, the great abolitionist, the famous orator. He was recognized very widely and is still very, very widely recognized 
maybe Trump didn't know about Frederick Douglass. Well, here's another. I don't want to keep on going on with these examples, but you want to know what kind of president you have. Uh, Trump was referring a couple of weeks ago to Abraham Lincoln. He said, great president. Most people don't even know he was a Republican, right? Does anybody know? A lot of people don't know that. We have to build that up a little more. He was speaking to a Republican group. Now, I don't know about you, but I, in school, in a little public school in northern New York State or mid-New York State, I learned that Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. I think I learned it in fifth grade. And by the way, the Republican Party has been holding annual Lincoln Day dinners across the country for more than 140 years. So does it matter that we have a president who doesn't know history? Uh, maybe it doesn't matter, but I, I think it does. You see, we did fight a revolution. We had a civil war. We had two world wars. Uh, now, we fought all of that basically to prevent tyranny of a sort that perhaps Donald Trump represents. We've also made some terrible mistakes. One of those mistakes was Andrew Jackson's treatment of Native Americans, for example, something that Donald Trump obviously doesn't know about or maybe doesn't care about, or Lyndon Johnson's Vietnam War, or George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq, just to name a few. As philosopher George Santayana once put it, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. By the way, speaking of the past, Hillary Clinton said today in an interview on CNN in which she criticized Donald Trump, she said, quote, I am part of the resistance, unquote. Last Sunday, Joe Biden also sounded resistance themes when he visited New Hampshire to get Democrats riled up. Now, I welcome Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden to the resistance, but I want to just issue two very gentle warnings. I don't want you to misinterpret what I'm saying, but number one, the more the resistance sounds partisan, the less effective it's going to be, because, you see, it then allows Donald Trump to characterize the resistance as just another democratic ploy to regain power. And that's what he's, he'd like to do. I, even if the investigations, even in the, if the investigations now underway into possible collusion between Trump's campaign and Russian operatives come up with real smoking guns showing that there was treason, that Trump had every reason to know what was going on, if the resistance becomes just a partisan show, then Trump is going to fog, issue a kind of fog machine around that report and blame the Democrats. But there's another second reason why the resistance needs to be understood for what it really is. Just more than anti-Trump. In other words, the resistance has got to stand for a resistance to the conditions that created Trump. I mean, even if we got rid of Trump, and I certainly hope we do, there are going to be more demagogues in the future if we have a system that is viewed by so many Americans as rigged for the benefit of people at the top. That was one of the reasons that Trump got elected. He appealed to that sense of indignation that so many Americans have about a system that is organized by wealthy people for themselves who have gained more and more prosperity while everybody else has languished. And unless the resistance takes that on, not just Trump, but the conditions that created Trump, then the resistance doesn't mean anything. We're just going to have more demagogues like Trump in the future, fueled by anger and cynicism of so many people who, who think that the game is completely rigged. Over the years, too many Democratic officials have aided and abetted a rigged economy 
and also aided and abetted, or at least watched as all of the gains, or most of the gains in the economy, went to the top, did not want to take on the powers that be. I was in the Clinton administration. I can tell you firsthand, when Bill Clinton sold overnights in the Lincoln bedroom to the highest bidders, it was said at the time that Clinton, Clinton's White House was one of the few hotels in America where the guests put mints on the pillow. Too many Democrats over the years have sought big money from large corporations and from Wall Street, money that has inundated and undermined our politics and our democracy. Let's face it. Democrats have not had the intestinal fortitude, the backbone, to demand hefty increases in taxes on the wealthy or even a wealth tax to pay for what we need to do to bring all of our schools, for example, up to world-class standards, even schools in poor areas. Democrats have not had the guts to go after Wall Street banks. Break up, break up the biggest Wall Street banks. Use antitrust laws to break up the increasing consolidation of American industry. The Obama administration did not do that. Antitrust was a dead letter under Obama. And the Democratic Party still doesn't have the backbone to call for a single-payer health care system. So while I want to invite and welcome Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden and other let's call them mainstream Democrats, into the resistance, let's be absolutely clear. We need a resistance that is going to fundamentally reform our political economic system so it is working for everyone and not just the privileged and the powerful at the top. Resisting Trump is necessary. But getting behind an agenda that takes back our economy and our Democracy is absolutely essential. Speaking of which, in terms of the corporate uh, irresponsibility that we hear about every day, today United Continental CEO Oscar Muniz, he apologized profusely to lawmakers on Capitol Hill for the forcible removal of a passenger you remember that. Quote, this is what he said, this is, turning, this is a turning point for United, unquote. Muniz told the House Transportation Committee. It was quite a tense hearing. My reaction, honestly, rubbish. Absolute rubbish. The incident is the tip of an iceberg. Anybody who flies today, you know exactly what I mean. Complicated bookings, confused fees, long waits, unexplained delays, a system in which passengers are increasingly treated like cattle. The committee chairman, by the way, Republican committee chairman of that hearing, Representative Bill Schuster, Republican of Pennsylvania, he said Congress will take action. He will take action if airlines do not act. And he warned that they would not like the outcome. The airlines would not like the outcome of the action that Congress will take. He said, airlines owe the public answers. Something is broken, said Representative Bill Schuster, Republican of Pennsylvania. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what's broken. What's broken is antitrust enforcement. In the year 2000, we had 12 major carriers in this country, major airlines, and they competed with each other. Now we're down to four major airlines after all the mergers and acquisitions, no antitrust enforcement at all. And when you have four major airlines, what does that mean? A lot of airports only have one major airline. What does that mean? No competition. What does no competition mean? It means that they're making a boatload of money, an airline full of money, the sky is the limit, and they can treat you and other customers and me like cattle and get away with it. If Republicans wanted to do something about this travesty, they would enforce the antitrust laws and force Trump and Jeff Sessions' Justice Department to enforce the antitrust laws. But we've come 
finally to the part of our little program where I like to provide kudos. Congratulations. Congratulations today goes to, wait for it, the Philadelphia City Council, which voted, just voted, to change the bank that handles its $2 billion payroll account from the scandal-ridden Wells Fargo to Citizens Bank. Said Councilwoman Cindy Bass, quote, Time and time again, Wells Fargo's actions have revealed them to be the antithesis of corporate social responsibility. I want to thank my colleagues on the committee for doing the right thing and sending a message that we will not do business with companies that engage in unethical business practices. Well, congratulations to... Councilwoman Cindy Bass, and to the Philadelphia City Council, every city should follow its lead. Why should taxpayers in any city subsidize corporate irresponsibility? And now, your questions. Betsy Anderson. House Republicans continue struggling to achieve enough votes to pass their latest health care debacle do you foresee a point at which legislators will concede defeat and shelve their attempt to pass their Affordable Health Care Act? Betsy, I do, but it will take, I believe, another few weeks. That's my prediction. You see, the reason that Trump is putting so much pressure on them is not only is it part of his promise during his campaign, but also he wants to use the savings from getting rid of basically the Affordable Care Act, for corporate and individual tax cuts. That's his plan. Without those savings, he's going to run into a buzzsaw from deficit hawks. Dave Chesson, Chesson, why is there no discussion by Congress, the President, or the media about the pharmaceutical industry having to give something up to help improve our health care system? Why is it always about what the middle class or poor have to give up to make the system survive? I'm especially concerned at the media f uh, framing this discussion around what Democrats and Republicans in Congress think should be done to project, protect those who pay their bills rather than looking at how the richest corporations and richest people should stand up and lead this country into greener pastures. Well, Dave, I'm not sure anybody who's all that wealthy or the corporate titans of America are going to lead America into richer pastures, but and greener pastures, that is. Uh, but let me just say this. You're absolutely right. The pharmaceutical industry has record profits. They won't allow the government to negotiate for lower drug prices. They won't allow people in the United States to get their pharmaceuticals cheaper from Canada. They are using the trademark and copyright laws to just keep their monopolies going forever, and we ought to attack them. Part of it is, again, antitrust. Ravina Shal, why, when there's so much evidence of Trump-Russia collusion, is there almost zero action? Ravina, because Republicans run both houses of Congress. And until that is ended, I frankly doubt we're going to see very much. Chris Brisson, do you believe the USA will ever be united under one party? Should we dissolve the, t the ties that bind the blue and the red? And what are you suggesting, Chris? We have a, another secession. The red states go one direction, blue states go another. Well, one of the geniuses of federalism enshrined in the Constitution is that we do have a lot of responsibilities left to the states. And Trump's efforts, whether we're talking about sanctuary cities or the environment or whatever, to basically preempt state law violates those principles of federalism and kind of forces red states and blue states into a kind of collision, which I don't think is necessary. Ron Ocher, what is the history with past elected officials who developed symptoms of dementia while in office. Uh, Ron, before the 25th Amendment, we didn't even have any thoughts in this country about what to do. We didn't even know. In fact, we still usually don't know. Ronald Reagan apparently had some of those symptoms, but most people did not know it at the time. 
But at least we do have a 25th Amendment. Now the question is, what do we do with it? If we have somebody who is showing signs of serious mental illness, maybe not dementia, but serious mental illness, how can we implement the 25th Amendment? Now I have here somewhere my handy dandy Constitution of the United States. I want you, this is your assignment tonight, look at the 25th Amendment to the Constitution. Read it. Contemplate how we use it. Peggy Fox, I'm concerned about the efforts to normalize Trump's incompetence. Peggy, I am too. I'm hearing things from the media saying he's learning to be more diplomatic and he's growing into the presidency. Is this an effort to lull us into complacency? Well, Peggy, I think it is a media effort not so much to lull us all into complacency or to normalize Trump, but just to calm everybody, including members of the media. The White House press corps, you know, they've been under enormous stress. They've been attacked, vilified, condemned by this president. And I think they would actually like him to be more normal. They want to pretend that forces around him are having a calming influence. But don't be fooled. Donald Trump, Trump is exactly the same narcissistic, sociopathic, unhinged man he was years ago. Nothing has changed him. Terry Ann Borstrom. I think Trump and his sycophantic cronies are a disgrace and menace to the American way of life, but once they're kicked to the curb, the real fight begins, dealing with the puppet masters. How can concerned citizens deal with the Koch brothers, corporate power, Citizens United? These oligarchs and their ilk are the real global terrorists. Well, Terry, and I tried to get to that point a little bit. The resistance really cannot just be about getting Trump out of office. It really does have to be about the power structure in the United States and altering that power structure. Because right now you have a vicious cycle in which more and more of the nation's income and wealth go to the top, and they use some of that income and wealth to influence and distort American politics, change the rules of the game so that they get even more income and wealth. Meanwhile, everybody else is left high and dry and cynical and angry, feeling like the game is rigged, and it is. And that's what we have got to deal with. Two more questions. Margaret Hines. How can organizations like Swing Left, Flippable, Sister District, and Indivisible join together? There are too many good organizations resisting Trump. I can't support all of them, yet they clamor for my attention and support. Well, Margaret, let me just say this. Bring out my little guide here. The organizations actually have different slightly different focuses. Here we have IndivisibleGuide.com. The goal of IndivisibleGuide.com is to give you tools to confront your members of Congress, to put pressure on your members of Congress. Uh, we have SwingLeft.org. The goal there is to help you identify districts near you that could use your help and support. And they might be close enough to you that you can actually travel there and Give them help, help and support, particularly with regard to the 2018 midterm elections. And then we have SisterDistrict.com, which is similar but not exactly the same thing. SisterDistrict.com is, is really basically designed, and it will be up and running and designed, so you can, if you're in a blue state, you can work with a specific purple district. And you and your indivisible group can make those kind of connections. Runforsomething.net. This helps you if you want to get directly involved and you actually want to run for something. And there are other organizations. I think they're all good. And uh, yes, I think they're coordinating. I hear from most of them. Uh, and they all need your support. And the last question. Christy Callahan, what kind of political action can citizens engage in this year to ensure a strong Democratic voter turnout in our local districts for 2018? Christy, the best thing that you can do is find out right now all you can about how the Democratic Party, if you're talking about the Democratic Party, in your area is organizing the primaries, how it's recruiting people if there are no incumbents already there, 
and also find out if there are challengers to a Democratic incumbent that better reflect your views. I mean, after all, the way the Tea Party essentially took over the Republican Party was in the primaries, the Republican primaries. So you need to look at the Democratic primaries as an opportunity to put people up who more and better reflect your views if the incumbent is not reflecting your views. And if there's a Republican incumbent, then you've got to get involved in the Democratic primaries and make sure that the Democratic candidate is attractive, the kind of person that you and others really want to organize around and for and mobilize for. We're doing it, folks. Donald Trump is meeting a huge amount of resistance because of the resistance. Take heart in how much progress and how much accomplishment we have actually engendered so far. There is much more to do. Thank you for all you're doing. Make politics not a spectator sport. Make it a practice, a daily or weekly practice. Citizenship. You're doing it. Thank you for your efforts. That is the end of tonight's resistance report. I'll see you tomorrow.